Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, and good evening to everybody watching. This is Dr. Maria Sophocles, and this is an episode of Gynecology, our uh, Facebook live stream show where we cover women's health topics and men's health topics and general health topics that hopefully people want to hear and learn about. Um, tonight, we have some really special guests, and I'm so grateful that they're willing to take some time to be with us. I'm going to introduce you to them. And um, uh, tonight will be kind of free form, not not so much, you know, some Q&A and some just telling and sharing of personal stories. Um, with me tonight is Dr. Susanna Nazarian, who is a um, member of the Thomas Jefferson University Department of Surgery. She comes there uh, via um, uh, from Penn and before that, I think at, at Hopkins where you trained and then you were out West for a number of years. And after many years as a trauma surgeon um, has begun- Transplant. As a transplant surgeon, I said yeah. trauma, as a transplant <laughs> surgeon. Thanks. Um, is sort of starting a new chapter in a way and helping Jefferson to start a new chapter. Um, and she is involved in top surgery for um, uh, patients undergoing uh, gender transformation surgery. Um, she um, uh, has uh, one of her, her very first patients with us tonight. Um, Ash is here. Ash is a female to male transgender. And um, uh, he and Dr. Nazarian have, have uh, gone through the top surgery together. And I think they'll both share their perspectives on that with us tonight. I certainly hope so. Um, uh, Taylor Chang is a, a non-binary queer medical student at Robert Wood Johnson. And um, uh, they're here to share their own story and perspective. And um, both Taylor and Ash uh, were telling us earlier about um, their experiences with some of the um, resources in the tri-state area um, for um, trans individuals. And so I hope tonight you all can learn something. I know you will and can get some of your questions answered. Feel free to post your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. It's only a little 30 minute uh, hors d'oeuvre uh, into a subject that we could probably talk for hours about. But I'm hopeful that if there's enough interest, um, and I'm sure there will be, that we could get um, um, some of our guests back to do a round two, um, perhaps with some additional guests. So, um, Ash, I'd like to start with you. I'd like to ask you a little bit about your story, and, and I'd like to ask you to share what you feel comfortable sharing, and then tell us how you began to approach thinking about um, actually having um, top surgery. So, I actually, I came out when I was 18. I came out as trans. And ever since then, my biggest obstacle was my chest. So for the past 10 years, I've gone to a plethora of different providers trying to take different routes uh, to obtain the top surgery. Um, I was primarily told that because cancer runs in my family, that if I took that route, that the insurance would pay for it, it'd be more covered. Um, I went through genetic testing. And that all came back negative, so they were unwilling to actually do anything because medically there was no reason. Mm -hmm. And then um, back in March, I went to the new Haddonfield location. Uh, I'd see Dr. Marina Kazan. She was the first provider to ever tell me this is possible. And I got really excited about it. Um, she sent me to one provider first, which is probably my biggest thing is uh, never be afraid of a second opinion. Uh, the first provider I spoke with, they were not as welcoming as I would like. They were more focused on your insurance isn't gonna cover it, how are we gonna do this? And more about that line of questioning. Um, I went back to my provider and I said, hey, I, I'm not really comfortable with them. And that's when they pointed me in uh, Dr. Nazarian's direction and her office. So the minute I walked in, they were really good with pronouns. They made me feel welcome. I, when she walked in, first question she asked, I want to know your story. And it was just amazing because she took the time to get to know me and what I was looking for and reassured that this is something we could do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Not just technically as a surgeon, but that this is a possible step for you in this transition. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. 
what what had you done before the surgery? What steps had you taken in your own transition? Um, before the surgery, I mean, I do go by he, him. I shortened my name. Okay. Um, I changed a lot of my clothing. I dress very masculine. Uh, for me personally, hormones is not a direction I really want to go. My biggest obstacle was my chest. Mm -hmm. And even now, like my friends, my family, my therapist, who is my best friend, she turned around and she was like, you're so much happier. Even she's talked to me two days after the surgery. She's like, you're a whole new person. She's like, you're just so happy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is all that I've ever wanted. That is great. That's great. But how long did it take you? from when you first thought about this to when you actually had the surgery? 10 years, going on 11. And what were the obstacles that made it take 10 years in your opinion? Uh, it was mostly the insurance, to be honest. A lot of the providers basically told me they were unsure that it would be covered, that I would have to take a whole different medical route than just saying, hey, I'm transgender and this is what I want. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of health insurances are actually becoming better with that. So there, for my insurance personally, there was a whole section where it was like, hey, all we really need is, you know, that you're transgendered on your medical records, which I have been for a couple of years. And then it was, we just need a letter from a therapist that says, this is something you've talked about. It's not something I woke up today and said, yeah, this is what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. um, my therapist was very happy to provide that letter for me. Dr. Nazarian, do you have a certain checklist that you have your patients go through before you'll do a, a top surgery? Um, yeah, so like sure. Meeting with a the therapist uh, or social worker or? Yeah, I, I think um, it's, it's very important that, that we all feel uh, that this is the right, you know, that this person has thought about this for a long time and that it's really affected their um, their well-being and their and their health and um, I, you know, you and I spoke before. I have been involved in transplant surgery for you know eight years. I now I'm a cancer surgeon, um, but I I honestly feel like and I just got some tears in my eyes when Ash was speaking because it's it's incredibly meaningful and humbling to participate in in his care and other patients' care because I I do feel like this is in some cases a life saving a life giving surgery. And, um, you know, it, it was wonderful to see Ash. Um, I mean, meet him in clinic. He was great, but then just kind of how he blossomed, um, even post up day one, like he didn't seem to get pain. He was just, he just was kind of glowing and, and it was, and, and kind of carried himself differently. And, and it really was, um, an honor to participate in that. And, um, you know, meeting my other patients who are pre-surgery and seeing what they do um, in binding themselves and have their skin break down and it hurts their back. And, you know, it's they got fungal infections because it's so hot and they're completely compressed all the time with no air. Um, I interrupt, you know, a patient recently um, to examine him and he had scars all over his breasts from cutting himself. Um, and, you know, I, I just... I want to be able to help people live in a better space. And um, that's what I want. But anyhow, back to your original question. Um, yeah, so there, I mean, there's, uh, I, I'm very fortunate to be at Jefferson where we have this freestanding LGBTQ affirming practice um, at, at, in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Um, it's wonderful, it just opened up in, in January and they're experts. And so I feel very comfortable partnering with them because they can take care of uh, you know, the hormones and, and kind of they have a, a psychiatrist on, on, on staff. Um, and so all these things are kind of, you know, I feel safe myself uh, performing the surgery because I know that I have expert eyes um, and expert care uh, watching over the patients as well. So that makes me feel a lot more comfortable. Okay. So Haddonfield sort of the initial funnel, the, the initial point of contact, and then there's psychiatrists there. there Ash told us there's a couple OBGYN physicians there. And as an OBGYN, I am so happy to hear that. Um, I'm not not so proud to say that a number of OBGYNs I know don't feel comfortable uh, even counseling trans patients. And I, while I respect their transparency and admitting that they don't, I hope that, that 
more recent graduates, more recent trainees will be able to, to feel more comfortable um, with counseling, with understanding the process, understanding social, medical, and surgical options. And um, I, I, so that leads me to Taylor, who's not necessarily going to be an OBGYN, but is a medical student. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope will be sort of spearheading a new, a new era of, um, of, of graduates who are educated, who are comfortable, who are um, socially and sexually comfortable talking about this. Um, my own background is uh, as an OBGYN, but now my my focus is in sexual medicine and sexual dysfunction. And just like in what you do, Susanna, it's so gratifying to restore um, a, a robust sexual life to to. Um, someone or to someone and their partner because it's part of their emotional health. It's part of their um, well-being and their sense of identity. And a natural segue to that is that your gender is part of your identity. So it only makes sense that Ash, once you you don't once you don't have the breasts that don't fit with your definition of you, you feel more like the person that you see yourself as. Is that? I hope that's right. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> there we go. I was clicking the wrong button. Um, no, definitely. Uh, my biggest thing now, like I even told Dr. Nazarian, like post-op, my last visit, I'm like, no, all right, I'm ready. Ready to go to the gym, ready to work out, ready to tone, like motivated for everything. And she's like, all right, slow down. <laughs> do that yet. She's well, like, could you I'm guys walk us through that a little bit um, in terms of how that happened from hi, nice to meet you to pre-op to surgery to recovery so that if anybody's considering um, top surgery, they'll kind of have a little better sense of, you know, g give us a quick FAQs, what to expect and that kind um, of thing. Well, from when I walked in, uh, we discussed it and she, uh, Dr. Nazarian was like, oh, you're going to go see the plastic surgeon. His name is Dr. Chang. Uh, very, very lovely man. Great guy. I went and met with him. Um, she had me do imaging but that's only because I had histories of tumors in my chest. So we just did imaging just to make sure, because I mean, while they're in there, they might as well check and make sure everything's okay. So we did that. Uh, she called me about two weeks later. She said, okay, we're going to do this day. We're going to do May 11th. And I just kind of looked, looked at the calendar. I'm like, that's, that's like three weeks. We can really do that. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll schedule everything. Don't worry about it. I'm like, all right. So, um, and then afterwards, I I have a very high pain tolerance, to be honest. I really wasn't in much pain. Um, mm -hmm. My biggest thing, get a body pillow, especially if you're a side sleeper. Get a body pillow because I still sleep like Morticia Adams. I can't sleep on my sides yet. That's still a little mm -hmm. painful. Mm -hmm. but I, I highly suggest a body pillow. <laughs> and um, recovery, were you overnight in the hospital? I was. I was overnight. Um, that was the longest I'd ever been under anesthesia. So I had a little bit of an issue with it, but they, right away, they helped me out with it. Dr. Nazarian, is it usually a joint effort between you and plastic surgeon? Yeah, the, the way that, that we're building this is that I, I'm working with a plastic surgeon who's highly skilled and also has the right outlook, I think, to, to work with people like Ash. Um, and um, you know, given that the the cosmetics is, is so vital, um, you know, my role is to remove the breast tissue. Um, his role is to uh, plan out the appropriate incisions and uh, position the nipple um, as is appropriate for a male breast. Um, we have one patient coming up who wants their nipples removed. Um, so just to make it look as, as uh, wonderful as possible, um, uh, because I, I want it, you know, this is the whole point. So, right. um, yeah, I, I, I want, I want someone with expert kind of uh, body contouring and expert plastics uh, training to, to, to be my partner. Yeah. And not to be ignorant, but since the male nipple is often smaller than female nipple, it, it's like a reconstruction of the areola then? Is that how? Yeah, how you can just shrink you the air. You can take the, some of the areola off and, and purse string it and, um, yeah, and make it look appropriate. Got it. Got it. The things we don't think about till we have to do them. Right. 
Taylor, yeah. tell me a little bit about your story and about um, whether as a non-binary and queer medical student, you have have felt that that medical education um, it has kept up with the times or is it still stuck a little bit in um, the dark ages? Um, or can you tell yet? Your first year, right? Your first year. Yeah, I just finished my first year at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Um, and I think to answer your like initial question, um, I think that we still have like, a little bit ways to go. I think, you know, curriculums are changing, but not everything is mandatory. And um, some of the language is still very much gendered. And even though I think many of us understand the difference between like gender and sex, sometimes just in speaking and giving lectures, these things are seen as interchangeable. So some of the language still has some ways to go, but it's definitely hopeful. I do think that, you know, with my class of students, I, I feel pretty hopeful with some of the friends that I've met, some of the other students and like really pushing for change and really trying to be you know, better advocates for our patients, for ourselves, for our friends. Um, and that is quite valuable as someone who identifies as non-binary and queer. Um, it feels really good, you know, to be surrounded by other students who will also like advocate for you um, and like kind of understand. And if they don't understand, it's also very nice that they reach out and ask questions and like want to learn more and are always looking to be, you know, a better ally or a better friend. Can you tell me about any clinics that you know in the um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey area that could be resources for um, um, individuals who are considering, who, who are trans and just are not sure where to get care or where to get their questions answered? Yeah. Um, the Proud Gender Center of New Jersey is like a great place to start. I know that they um, are a center that actually refers out to physicians um, and specialists at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. Um, and I've worked with a couple of those physicians. They've given some lectures. Uh, I do research with some of them and they are pretty great um, so far. They, the Proud Gender Center also has like an LGBTQ um, patient navigator. So definitely they're a resource um, that is pretty equipped to handle, you know, just general questions about where to look for physicians, but also like give information about maybe other things um, someone might be looking for when transitioning. So like haircut or like where to go to get a haircut, um, mm -hmm. things like that. Things that may not be um, necessarily related to healthcare, but are very much part of someone's transition. That's right. Um, yeah. I would also like to mention that um, for myself, like I said, I identify as non-binary, um, but um, a personal decision of mine is that I haven't sought out any type of like medical gender affirming care. So I'm not on hormones and I haven't had any type of surgery. Um, and I think it's just kind of an important narrative that you can identify as trans and not seek any of these services. Uh, and it's really great that there are, you know, healthcare providers out there um, who will provide it if you want it, but it's not for everyone and that's totally fine. Ash, were you going to say something? Oh, I completely agree. 100% <laughs> with everything that Taylor just said. Because that's, it's a big thing for me that I kind of struggled with a lot. Because the only thing I wanted in my process, as of right now, was just my top surgery. I wasn't really seeking hormones or anything else. But my providers have all been really great about that. Even um, Dr. Park, my OBGYN, she was like, well, we can call you Mr. Richmond. I said, no, Ash is fine. <laughs> Well, I, just fine. I think that's that's the the point of all this though is that every story and every journey is unique and it is very multifocal and it is um social societal sexual emotional hormonal and and I think the, the point of any good provider and Dr. Nazarian and I have lots of years of experience between us as surgeons but what we're learning as as providers is that is that each one is individual and it, it we are not to treat everyone just as a surgical candidate but as a, a unique human being who has her own or his own story and his own desires or her own desires and i found that too uh, for sure that um some of my patients want hormone therapy but don't want any surgery and some vice versa so you know it's it's been a learning curve for me professionally, I'm still climbing it. I think Dr. Nazarian was very honest and humble about the fact that she she's learning it too. 
but I think we both agree that it's incredibly gratifying. And, you know, we've both taken cancer away and, and helped, you know, save lives and done all these things that are traditional measures of, of uh, ego gratification as a surgeon, but um, helping trans patients with their journey is, is super gratifying. And I, I just touch on the very most peripheral stuff. Um, so Taylor will be back in a second. Her connection just got lost. It's been kind of iffy weather, but, but, um, but anyway, they'll be back. Um, what else, um, you know, can you, either of you share with our people watching that you think would be helpful in terms of them having the courage to maybe take a step towards seeing someone or, um, or where they could go. I mean, Taylor mentioned the Proud Gender Clinic. We talked a little about the Haddonfield Clinic. Um, the Mazzoni Center, did we talk about that? Yeah, um, I've heard of them. I've heard very good things about them. Uh, personally, I have not been there, but I know a few of my friends have gone and that's where they have started their journey and they loved it there. Okay, well, we'll put some links and the banner for that and for the um, Proud Gender Clinic and for the Haddonfield Clinic, which, um, Susanna, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, just Jefferson's goals and hopes and what Jefferson is building so that patients know that Jefferson's a center that can, it's early and it's starting, but that, um, you know, where they could have um, trans-friendly, um, ears to listen and eyes to look and and um, clinicians to care. Sure, yeah, I mean, um, I was really, uh, I'm new to Jefferson, but I was really excited to, to kind of stumble across the, the Haddonfield Clinic, honestly, and that was just in the process of getting to know, you know, providers in the New Jersey area, because I, I work in New Jersey and also in Philadelphia, so um, since I live in I live in Pennsylvania, so uh, I was just trying to understand the the lay of the land. So I was it was almost like a summing upon a, a diamond um, as you as you're exploring your surroundings. Um, so, but you know, coming to understand more about Jefferson again, being being new to the the uh, program here, but um, having now that we've started doing top surgery and 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 Ash being our first patient, which was so fun to mm -hmm. to see him. Um, you know the the floodgates seem to be opening and, and I think through word of mouth, um, I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing about, I, I do Monday clinics over in New Jersey. I'm seeing one or two patients per Monday, uh, seeking top surgery. And then they're, uh, where is that? Where is that? I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, presently I'm seeing people in Washington township, New Jersey. Um, I may in the future be moving primarily to Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Okay. And then also I'm right now in my office in Philadelphia. So, um, uh, any of that would work, but, um, we also do telehealth of, of course. Um, but just to say that, um, since this, this has started to kind of, uh, evolve organically, um, uh, the leadership at Jefferson is extremely interested in building, um, a very comprehensive top level regional, um, side of excellence for all aspects of LGBTQ and trans care. And, you know, I, I can't speak for um, authoritatively about everyone's uh, plans in detail, but just to say that um, I've been um, in contact with the, the leadership of the enterprise who are very interested in, in uh, building a, a real center of excellence and, and with every aspect of, of care for this population. So um, I think it comes from a very good place. Um, I think they're extremely interested from a population health standpoint of being, you know, absolutely top-notch um, allies and um, experts and scientists and medical professionals to to help the LGBTQ community. So I, I'm really excited to be um, just kind of at the, the vanguard of all this and, and um, very, very humbled. That is exciting. And we totally look forward to hearing what chapter two, you know, or what, how it develops. But I, I have such faith in Jefferson to really throw their weight behind it and to, to do it well. Um, and, um, you know, to, to kind of have a soup to nuts approach, because I think that's what you need. I think you need to have a place where um, individuals feel comfortable taking the first step and, and feel welcome and feel that, you um, 
they're not coming as someone with a problem. They're coming with someone with an identity and a story and a journey that just needs to be, you know, allowed to transpire. Um, so there is a question. Someone has a question. So I think we'll ask these guys if they'll post the question, our, our people, and we can say, um, thank you all for being here tonight. I came in late. You may have answered this, but if you haven't, here's my question. What support is available for preteen trans kids in New Jersey? Not so much as for an endocrinologist or mental emotional therapy, but social involvement and education about development. That's um, great. Hi, that welcome, feel welcome like back. Um, Taylor, oh, hey, Taylor, the question, and you and Ash can, can tackle this. This is going to be better than either of the doctors, I think. <laughs> um, the Haddonfield office, they are a primary care specialty. So, I mean, they do offer the mental health and everything, but like I go there just to see my regular physician for a checkup and her and I discuss, you know, different things that are going on. I really believe that they would be able to help, you know, mm -hmm. uh, go through anything that maybe a preteen might encounter with puberty or anything like it's not just a place for hormones and things like that like you can go just for your everyday I have questions and they're a really good support system there so the Haddonfield Clinic and do you your therapist you said also was excellent so I might ask you to share that with me after the show so I could pass that on to to the um the wonderful woman asking the question, because I actually know who she is. She's an awesome patient. <laughs> so I probably shouldn't say that. But anyway, so we'll, we'll I'd, I'd love to be able to get her that therapist name in case, you know, she has a preteen um, or more who would, who would yeah. want to come up. Appreciate that. Taylor, any advice on where you could go to get, you know, resources? I, I have something for Princeton, but I'll let you go first. <laughs> Yeah, um, the main resource that I do know is the Proud Genders uh, Clinic of New Jersey. Um, and I do know for a fact that like they have a support group. I'm not sure if it's um, for preteen um, trans kids, but I do know there it, it exists. So I do imagine that they have um, some resources and could point you definitely in the right direction um, about, you know, maybe there are preteen um, you know, trans support groups. Um, activities. I know that they have um, different types of support groups. So yeah, I would definitely recommend the Proud Gender Center. Proud, Genders, Proud Gender Clinic. And then in right in Princeton, we have something, I think not the best named clinic, but a great place called High Tops, H-I-T-O-P-S. High Tops is quite unique. Um, and it's, it's just wonderful little home right in the middle of Princeton. And they have um, counselors there and they have been there for gosh, over 20 years, um, uh, counseling, um, you know, pretty much anybody who felt uncomfortable with who they are or what they were or where they were going. Um, and they have peer education support as well. So they have groups that get trained to be peer counselors, which is so wonderful, you know, to be 16 and have a 16 year old you can talk to, um, as well as, um, adults with with just lots and lots of training and expertise. So High Tops in Princeton is is um, also I think worth looking into. Um, I I don't want to keep you guys too long, but I think this was super important, and I think um, we've learned I've learned anyway that there's um, you know a burgeoning center at Jefferson that's just beginning, and Dr. Susanna Nazarian has been so gracious. She literally came right out of the operating room to to talk with us. Um, <laughs> next time we'll see your cream suit, Dr. Nazarian. <laughs> um, and um, Taylor, do you have any any kind of parting words or thoughts or just advice for anyone who might be out there? And remember, not even just someone who's trans, but someone who, um, who maybe even has a child who's gender questioning. And, you know, it's stressful to be that person, but it's stressful to be a parent too. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it would, my advice would be like, keep trying to find providers that are gender affirming that like support your child or that support you if you are the patient, because they exist. They are definitely a hard, harder to find, but there's becoming more and more of them. Um, so keep looking. I know that it's hard, um, but there are resources out there and keep asking questions. Um, there you, are resources. Can you tell us about your app? 
a little bit? Oh yeah, so I'm in the process of building an app. It's aimed at trans folks. It's a healthcare app and the idea behind it is that um, it's really hard to find gender affirming um, physicians, providers of any specialty, like primary care, for example. So the idea behind the app is that trans folks would use it and leave reviews about healthcare providers that they have seen. Um, and the reviews would be seen by other trans folks using the app, hopefully looking for a physician in that specialty. So for example, um, if I needed to find a plastic surgeon, maybe Dr. Nazarian, um, someone has, Ash has left a review about Dr. Nazarian in that app and I can go look and see what that review says. And if Ash says basically she's great, then that gives me reassurance as a trans person that if I go to her office, um, I can feel comfortable. It's it's kind of hard as a trans person walking in blind. So that's the idea behind my app. It's called Trans App right now. It's in the building process, but I'm sure I will advertise it and people will hear about it. But that is the idea behind it. Awesome. Well, I, I know two physicians who will, who will definitely promote it anyway. I, I know we'd be really, really proud to, do, to be involved in, in terms of just making it um, – you know, making our patients aware of it, because I, I know, I'm sure, you, you know, uh, Dr. Nazarian has experienced what I have, which is patients coming saying, you're the, you're the third physician I'm going to, because the first two said, we don't, we don't, or, or they didn't even say anything. There's a feeling or, you know, a lack of a rainbow flag in the window or whatever it is that, um, you know, uh, that, that gives you a feeling that this is not a, um, a sort of fluid environment or a progressive open vibe. And we, we sure don't want that. So um, onward and upward. Um, I, again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm Maria Sophocles. This has been Gyna College. And we we do this through my practice, um, Women's Healthcare of Princeton, uh, two Thursdays a month right now. And uh, hopefully we'll do a little more because it's really so much fun. Um, the next one is something... <laughs> No trans man once. Do I need a period? Is it healthy not to have a period? Tips and tricks to skip the bleeding. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, never know. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. And who knows, maybe we'll do a round two and we can, um, w you know, we can address some of the other things. Some of we can get a little deeper into the endocrinology or even the bottom surgery. Um, you know, I spent a lot of today practicing saying metoidioplasty because that's a tough one to say. <laughs> but um, to find out exactly what that is, you'll have to tune into the next one. So have a good night. Thank you so, so much. And Dr. Nazarian, keep up the good work. And Ashton Taylor, keep keep plugging, okay? Thank you. Uh, it was really great to be a uh, part of this. And it's wonderful to, to meet Ashton Taylor and you too, Dr. Sophocles. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Have a good night.